Now let's turn to the breakdown of the colonial um, social system. Uh, by the middle of the 18th century, we see that the system breaks down because of, number one, economic crisis. The Spanish were drawing so much silver from the mines in Mexico and in Peru that it began to actually um, weaken their currency. Um, because if you flood the market with precious metals like silver, which your, your currency is based on, it makes the currency worth less. So the Spanish um, currency began to, to collapse. Secondly, racial mixing and identity confusion were a, pr a problem uh, because the Spanish were unable to um, legally determine which class uh, people belong to according to race if you allow racial mixing. And then geographical, geographical complexity of the colonies. You had um, in Texas and in California, you know, plains and uh, mountains. And um, then in Central and South America, you had jungle and... Um, Ocean front and uh, de you know, all kinds of different desert, you know, all kinds of different um, geographical complexities. So it became harder for the Spanish to control such a large territory, and the crown began to sell what are called uh, certificates of whiteness, which would guarantee peop that people um, could buy a certificate and guarantee legally that they would be considered white. And this caused a lot of problems because if you were um, a mestizo or a mulatto and you bought a certificate of whiteness, that meant that even though you, you may be dark-skinned, you would be able to apply for a job that a white person could apply for. Um, and the Crown made a lot of money out of this, but it caused a lot of um, issues um, because um, power in Latin America went from uh, whites at the top to blacks at the bottom. So you, the, the darker your skin, the less political, economic, and social power you have. But if you buy a certificate of whiteness, this meant that you can actually buy yourself um, into um, a higher class. So um, the crown's making money, but it causes a whole lot of confusion. Now, by 1800, Spain's grip began to weaken uh, because of the economic crisis. And what made things worse for the Spanish was the fact that uh, two... Um, revolutions had happened in the interim. Um, the American Revolution was completed in 1781. The American Constitution by 1789 was done. And then in 1789, the French launched their revolution and executed their king in 1792. So we see that um, the Spanish um, elites, the, especially the Creoles, really want to get rid of the Spanish, much like uh, the way that American white elites wanted to get rid of the British. And they see the American Revolution as a model, and they also draw inspiration from the French, that you can actually get rid of your oppressors and uh, launch a revolution. And uh, the big, you know, the big um, document of the decade was the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which appeared in Spanish in 1790. And this guaranteed uh, the rights of um, men, at least, and um, representative government. So um, it was you know, this sort of anti-royal, anti-monarchical statement that many Creoles really liked. So th the, the, the revolutionary fervor was driven really by um, the Creole elites, you know, those who could read. Um, so things are going to be really problematic for the Spanish. And then in 1810, we see the launching of the Hidalgo Revolt. It took a good two decades for these revolutionary ideas to really filter down you know, to the masses, because um, you had uh, a situation where most people are illiterate, the culture is very diverse, you know, between m m mulattoes, mestizos, um, free slaves, uh, you know, freed black slaves, etc. Um, so you've got a very, very diverse society. And in 1810, um, a man named Miguel Hidalgo, who's a very, very prominent priest in Mexico, um, became imbued with these revolutionary ideas. And you could see this statue of him on the left. He became a very, very important icon to many revolutionaries. And what made him very prominent was he was a great speaker. He um, would uh, preach revolution from the pulpit, essentially. And um, he believed that the Spanish government was the reason for the suffering of his parishioners. You know, high unemployment, uh, low economic growth, racism, things of this nature were really problematic. Uh, now, Hidalgo 
really comes down to us uh, today uh, in many historians of Latin America as a caudillo. And a caudillo is um, a very complex term. In English, it roughly means dictator. Um, and I, I don't mean dictator in the sense of 20th century, you know, fascist dictators like Mussolini or Hitler or even communist dictators like Stalin. But a dictator, uh, a caudillo rather, was a leader um, who in, had certain characteristics that made them a leader. Now, um, the first thing you needed to have if you're going to be a caudillo was forcefulness of character. And this is something that Hidalgo really had in spades. He um, was um, a priest who was prominent, who spoke all over Mexico. He believed very deeply in the cause of, of revolution and getting rid of Spanish oppression. And people really looked up to him because he, was, he wasn't afraid to take a stand. Also machismo, uh, which roughly translated means masculinity. You know, to be a caudillo, you must uh, be masculine. You know, um, people must look upon you as someone as a man who's comfortable in his own skin. And, uh, you know, Hidalgo really was. I mean, even though he was a priest, he had many lovers in his lifetime. He lived for a long time with a woman, almost as man and wife. He couldn't marry her because he was a priest. But um, in, in Latin American culture, you know, um, he was respected because he was um, a man who was not, um, you know, uh, af didn't apologize for, for his manliness. And finally, what made Hidalgo um, a caudillo was his capacity to collect followers through professional family and class ties. Now, for Hidalgo, um, his professional ties were very, very strong. You know, he was a very well-respected priest. He was a godfather to many. He married many couples. He, he buried many, um, you know, in funeral orations. So he really was um, someone who was very, very, you know, very connected to the fabric of the the society around him. Uh, he wasn't just a priest who nobody saw. He was very active in the community. So this is very different from you know the, the dictators of the 20th century, um, who get their power very differently, either through through um, a political coup or some other kind of superficial military reason. Um, to be a caudillo in the Latin American context is to be someone who is respected, someone who is forceful and someone who really um, has very deep connections to the people around um, them. Um, now, why, why, am I make, why am I making a big deal about caudillos? It's because caudillos are really the ones responsible for propelling the revolution forward, you know, the, the, the war for independence against the Spanish. And these caudillos are going to be very important for the creation of um, Latin American countries that are going to spring up after the revolution. Mexico, Venezuela, uh, places like that, Argentina, all of them are going to be run by, by caudillos. Some are democratic caudillos, some are not. Um, they're a very, very diverse group. Some of them are priests like Hidalgo, some of them are generals like Simon Bolivar, uh, who's really like the George Washington of Latin America. So this is really a, a very Hispanic kind of um, uh, cultural thing, you know, I, we don't see the caudillo in, a, in an American context, but really only in a Latin context. Now, what caused the Hidalgo revolt? Uh, well, uh, interestingly enough, Hidalgo decides um, in uh, the fall of 1810 to try to um, march on uh, Mexico City and destabilize the Spanish um, Empire and uh, he does pretty well he gets um, maybe 50 to 70,000 um, campesinos peasants to uh, follow him you know a very diverse group you know uh, many mestizos some creoles uh, some mulattoes he gets to follow him because of his his message is very very simple you know resistance to oppression death to bad government and he gets to the gates of Mexico City in uh, late fall of 1810 and the problem with um, Hidalgo is he's not a military man he doesn't have a lot of military he doesn't have a military background so when he gets to th you know the gates of Mexico City he is met there by um, a very important um, 
caudillo named Felix Calleja, who was um, another type of caudillo, who was a Spanish um, uh, army officer in the, in, the, in the Mexican army, and he stops Hidalgo with only about 15,000 well-disciplined troops. Um, uh, Calleja had come to, to, to Mexico from Spain, married into a very wealthy Creole family, and um, was a very, very talented military leader. Now, the impact of the Caudillo on more modern Latin American history is um, very important. The Caudillos helped to unify a diverse Latin American society and geography. So the Caudillos are really unifiers. And even though Hidalgo loses, you know, he gets to the gates of Mexico City with his men. Um, he can't hold it together long enough to hold the city um, or even invade it. But he does destabilize you know, the, the, the Spanish um, Empire, because Mexico City was one of the major, w one of the major capitals in the em within the empire. Um, he does inspire other people to step forward as caudillos, to help unify a very, very racially diverse uh, culture against the Spanish. And that's really the role of the, of, of the caudillo. And Hidalgo becomes a, a major inspiration. So there are other caudillos inspired by his example who step forward uh, after 1810 to help bring the revolution uh, to a conclusion. So in eight by 1825, the Spanish are gone um, from most of their colonies except for Cuba and uh, in Puerto Rico, where they stay a little bit uh, longer. But most of, of the, the continent is, is um, liberated. Uh, so the Caudillos are very, very important for Latin American his, um, history. Here is um, a very important um, painting done by um, a Mexican artist, Juan O'Gorman, um, and it hangs in um, one of the more prestigious uh, galleries in, um, in, in um, the, the uh, Mexican National Museum. And here we see um, in the front a man dressed in black in, in, in priestly robes. That's, Caudi uh, that's um, Hidalgo, um, and he's leading thousands of people uh, mostly men here, uh, on their quest to take Mexico City. And they do help to destabilize the empire enough that um, even though he's hanged for treason, uh, others take up the banner of, um, of justice and liberty and freedom. Uh, and we can see who's following him. We can see there are Native Americans there, there are Creoles, there are mulattoes and mestizos. And you can see there's a flag, a white flag, behind Hidalgo that is of the Virgin Mary. So not only is um, it a political crusade for Hidalgo, but also partly religious, uh, because the Virgin Mary becomes um, a symbol of um, freedom and liberty and is used by the revolutionaries to do that. And we also see this in France, too, the, the use of uh, Marianne, the symbol of liberty, or the United States, where the, the, the Statue of Liberty is, is a woman inspired by the Virgin Mary, are uh, beacons of liberty. Uh, so this is a very, very important painting that illustrates very nicely the role of the Caudillo as unifiers in the revolutionary tradition. And I, I, I can't state this enough that we don't see the Caudillo in France or the United States. Um, you could say to an extent that maybe Toussaint Louverture in Haiti uh, is a type of Caudillo maybe, um, although he, he acts more like a, like a traditional kind of dictator, you know, than, 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 a, than a caudillo. So it really is more of a, a kind of a Hispanic um, phenomenon. And in the next um, um, slides, you can see other caudillos. Fidel Castro um, is considered by many to be a caudillo. Um, Juan Perón, who was president of Argentina twice, uh, certainly was considered a, um, a caudillo, and his wife, a caudilla, um, Eva Perón. Uh, Porfirio Diaz was a very important um, caudillo in the late 19th century who actually modernized Mexico, brought uh, the um, railroads uh, to Mexico and helped to bring Mexico into um, the world economy, even though he was a dictator and, and didn't like democracy. And that concludes our lecture. Uh, thank you.